going to ask uh, Pastor Matt Fast. He's uh, I mean, his wife and family are new to the community, and we just want to welcome Pastor Matt as he comes and shares in the scripture. Well, good morning. It is good to be here. It's already almost been a year since we moved to 100 Mile. That feels already like a lifetime <laughs> in a very good way. <laughs> no, I am, uh, I am, my name is Matt Fast. You can call me Matthew, whatever. Um, and I am the pastor at the E-Free Church in town here. And it's been an absolute blessing uh, to be there, to be with that community, and to be with you this morning. You know, the first nine years of my life, I lived in Ontario. Don't hold it against me. (laughs) And behind our house was a schoolyard. And uh, on the far side of it was this big hill that backed up onto the forest. Um, And my brothers and I, we would play on that hill all the time. That was our backyard. Um, And one fall, the town had started a project. Um, And as we know, you know, sometimes projects started in the fall don't get completed in the fall. Um, And this one didn't. And they had been putting a drainage ditch in at the base of this hill. Um, And so then winter hit and the snow covered everything, filled up the ditch. And when spring came and all the snow melted, it was a nice big ditch of water. Um, We're very... uh, That's a very common thing, isn't it? Um, And my brothers and I, we were back on our bikes and playing on that hill and around the school. And one time in particular, we were playing a game of cops and robbers. Um, And there I was on one side of the ditch, and my brothers were on the other. And I was the cop, and I had to get them. And, uh, well, I mean, Clint, as you know, you got to do what you got to do. So I thought to myself, what is the quickest way to get to them? It was to cut through this massive ditch that had been dug the fall before. And so I wriggled underneath the fence that was keeping people out of there. And there was a good reason the fence was there. The spring runoff had filled the ditch with water, and it was probably three or four feet deep. And and they had these large chunks of construction debris floating in it. But this was exactly why I thought it was a good idea. Because I don't know if you know this about me, but my last name is Fast. (laughs) And obviously, that meant I was fast. And I thought I could run fast enough that I'd be able to jump from one piece of debris to the next piece of debris across this ditch like a ninja. (laughs) And so I braced myself, I psyched myself up and took off like a flash. And for the first few steps, it kind of worked. And I thought to myself, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And then, sploosh, down into this dirty construction water. Who knows what chemicals were in there? Absolutely soaked followed by a walk of shame back to my house across the field in wet jeans in the cool spring air. It was not fun. Just when I thought I would make it, I realized I couldn't. You know, this life is funny that way. We easily get into a place where we think we have what it takes, that nothing can stop us, That on our own, we are strong enough, fast enough, loving enough. But then seemingly out of nowhere, we get caught in our own trap and we go down. It doesn't take too much to teach us that on our own, we just simply can't. That we need someone else to walk with us. When we look at life, it is full of unfortunate things. 
It's full of brokenness and full of people crossing others, full of hurt and hang-ups and hardness. And no matter how hard we work, we, we can't seem to solve it. If there's anything we can expect in this life, it's that we will let ourselves down, that others will let us down, and then that we will let down others. Because we're humans, and and humans struggle, and humans are broken. And this problem we face, it's not a situational problem, it's an inherent problem. We were designed to be in perfect relationship with our Creator with our God, and and with each other. But in an act of pride and selfishness, we offended that. We became enemies to the God who loves us. And the very fabric of our relationship was torn apart. And try as we may, there will always be that mark of sin on us unless we are remade. Unless we are forgiven. Unless the debt we owe is paid. I love that we sang that song. We will never make it across the ditch of water to the other shore unless. Today we're we're looking at the last moments of Christ on the cross. And what he chose to do as he hung there in view of all. We're in Luke 23, 32 to 43 as, as Rick just read. And for the past three weeks at the, the, the E Free Church, we've been going, we've been looking at the road Jesus walked to the cross. As he walked it with gentleness and with honesty, as he walked it as the unperceived king and as the humble king. And now he continues to travel down the road. And everything he came to do, moments away from being finished, from being accomplished, and yet in this moment. He takes the time within his own agony, hanging on the cross. I know when I, like, hurt my finger, that's all I can think about. But here's Jesus hanging on the cross, and he takes time out of his own agony to minister to one more person. So let's read this passage again together. Starting in verse 32, it's 23, 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but... The rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God. He's his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Before we continue, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good. Father, there's a reason it is called Good Friday. Because that w- without what you did, Lord, we would just have absolutely no access to goodness, to you. We would not experience that love, that, that sacrifice, Father, and we are so thankful for that because we'd be lost without it. 
We'd be lost without you. And Father, as we look into Scripture this morning, may you speak to us, in us, through us. Father, the words coming out of my mouth, may they be honoring to you. In your name we pray, amen. You know, it would have been very easy for Jesus to look at those around him and hate them. They had persecuted him, tortured him, spent the the last three years trying to discredit him, and now they've nailed him to a wooden cross to die. It would have been easy to hate those who were against him. But Jesus walked the road of forgiveness. And in this moment, Jesus makes one of the greatest statements in the Bible. One that speaks of his heart and is his prayer to God. In verse 34 and 38, we see the, the people attending the death of what the people attending the death of Christ are doing. It says they cast lots to divide his garments. The people stood by watching. The rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Jesus wasn't the Messiah they had been expecting. And even in his death, he continues to be counter to what they thought. And they make a mockery of his power because they misunderstand his purpose. See, Jesus, believe it or not, on the cross, he was in control. His death was part of his plan of salvation. In Psalm 22, 6 to 8 and 18, it says, All who see me mock me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Then in Psalm 69, it says, They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Does it remind you of anything? Hundreds of years before Christ hung on the cross. These aren't just songs that David wrote, but they stand as prophecy for the suffering king. They scoffed at him, mocked him, watched him die without realizing that he did it all for them. And for the sin of the world. You see, Jesus turned kingship upside down. He was humble and loving where an earthly king would not have been. And it is in and it's in his acts on the cross as he died that his true royalty shines through. It exposes the heart of humanity. And then it greets it with love and forgiveness. In verse 34, Jesus says some of the most incredible words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This was his prayer to his Father. God in heaven. You know, it's important to understand that this, that Jesus' prayer of forgiveness wasn't to absolve them of their actions, even though those actions were done in ignorance, but it was a prayer to postpone judgment. That they would have time to seek forgiveness for what they had done. Just a little while later in Acts 3, 17 and 19, Peter tells the people of Jerusalem, Now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that His Christ would suffer, He thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. God is the God of the time to find forgiveness. It is His heart. And His heart is what leads us to truth. You know, people hear the truth of Christ all the time from the church. But until they experience Jesus' forgiving heart, that truth remains out of reach. 
The reality, as Jesus says in John 14, 6, is I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's a reason it's said in this order, by the way. When we know the way of Christ, which is forgiveness, then we find the truth of Christ. And as we reach out to grab the truth, we find life there. He desire, his desire is, is that all, even those who, put, who, who have put Christ to death, would be able to come to him and find forgiveness and be reconciled to him. He gives them time. He gives us time. You know, I have two kids, and they will often test my limits. They will disobey to the point where I give them their last warning. One more time, and you're going to be in bigger trouble. And you see in their heads the cogs turning as they're thinking whether or not I am actually serious about it. Is it worth the risk? And then they take one more step, and I have to act. And I don't like it, but I have to act. And they miss out on something, or they're sent to the room for a timeout, but, you know, even then, they're given grace. Because what do I tell them? Say, hey, I love you, but you're going to need to take a bit of time out. And when you're ready to come and be with the family respectfully and gently and lovingly, then you can come out. They usually fight it for about 10 minutes in their room. But lo and behold, as they are given time, they start to see that they were wrong. Where there is life, there is still hope. You know, God has long-lasting love and grace. And His desire is that in the time He has given to us, that we would start to see that we were wrong. And that His forgiveness is how we are made right. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises. Some count slowness but patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Who are we in this story? The mockers, the scoffers, the watchers, or maybe we used to be those people. Do we see who actually hung on the cross and why he did? You know, this isn't just an issue with people who don't believe uh, in, in Christ, but it actually can be an issue with those who do as well. The disciples sure had a hard time coming to a full faith, didn't they? They had a hard time relying on who he was. At the time of his death, only one disciple was there. The rest had scattered because they were afraid and they weren't sure what would happen to them. They weren't sure if Jesus was actually God. They weren't sure if he had been defeated or not. Death sure looks final, doesn't it? Life is hard and full of brokenness. It doesn't carry a lot of hope many days. We need someone to walk that road with us. To walk it for us first so that we can walk it with them. And then through us. You know, our foundation as Christ followers rests solely on who we believe hung on that cross. You know, if it was anyone other than the God of the universe, then our faith is in vain. But if it was Him, then our faith in Him is the most vital thing in existence. And this should change everything in our life. If Jesus can pray for forgiveness from the agony of the cross for those uh, uh, who killed him, then we should be able to show forgiveness from the places in our life as well and experience that. And let me tell you who you aren't in the story. Jesus. 
Jesus prayed for our forgiveness to show us that hope is not only for life after death, but for our life today. When we know Christ, we walk in the light of his forgiveness now. Jesus walked the road of forgiveness for his enemies. And it's only because he did that we can find forgiveness in him now. It's hard to see our own sin, though. It makes us so uncomfortable to see our own problems. We don't like to look at that stuff. There's a reason that we all hate the job interview question, what would you say your greatest weaknesses are? (laughs) Nothing. No. (laughs) That's not true. You know, we don't like to look at, at, at our issues because this world, it's built on perception, isn't it? We tend to self-pity more than we own up to things. We tend to work hard to look the part rather than be authentic. We don't like to ruffle feathers. That is, unless our feathers are ruffled first. We avoid confrontation and conflict, confession and clarity, like the plague. But here is the thing. At the foot of the cross, as you come to see who actually hung on it, it is impossible to hide. And either you get hostile about it or you get humbled by it. Jesus also walked the road of truth. And that truth becomes a promise when we seek forgiveness. In verses 39-41, Luke writes, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we're receiving our due reward for our deeds But this man has done nothing wrong. These two criminals were robbers. And their crime was obvious. The word chosen to, uh, it means armed robbery involving murder. It was public what they did. Their crime was obvious. And this is who Christ hung alongside of. And what a picture it is of Christ's heart for us. You know, over the past three years, he had spent his time with sinners and tax collectors, with the perceived scum of the earth, offering them peace and hope. And now he hangs beside them as he dies for them. I imagine that these two criminals had heard what Christ had just said about forgiveness just moments earlier. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And and one of them, he, he doesn't get it. It's like, why would you do that? Why would you look at these people and say that? He doesn't understand Jesus' love, and so he chooses to become hostile And he joins the mockers. He joins his own enemies, the people who put him up on the cross, in order to spit curses at Christ. In our humanness, how impossible it is to love when you've been nailed to a cross. Make them pay for what they have done to you. This is the human perspective. Look out for number one. I mean, we watch movies like this all the time, don't we? That's it. I'm hunting you all down, right? And yet, in Christ, that um, impossible thing becomes possible as he chooses to love instead of get even. Isaiah 53, 12 says, He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. 
yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And this is what the second criminal sees. The willful pouring out of Jesus' soul for humanity. You know, both these criminals had equal access to Christ in that moment. Both could read the mocking sign above his head. Both saw the treatment of him. Both could uh, watch him as he graciously gave his life for the sins of the world. Both had a moment to respond. One chose hostility, while the other chose humility. At the foot of the cross, we come face to face with truth. And this thief courageously went against the grain of humanity and put his trust in a dying king. What many would have called risky or unwise. It's like, don't you see that he's dying? But he knew in his heart, after witnessing Jesus' heart right in that moment, that Christ would not stay dead, that he was God. Because only God could love like that. You know, I do, uh, I do judo in town here. It's a lot of fun. And there are these throws you can do in judo. Uh, they're called sacrifice throws. And they're ones that leave you vulnerable to counterattack. And if you don't pull them off, you're in trouble. And you'll probably be pinned and lose the match. But if you do pull them off, you win the match right then and there. It's a major risk. And to others on the outside, maybe it would seem crazy to put yourself in that position. But when you know what you're doing, it's an incredible move that gains victory. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. When it came to his sacrifice on the cross, and this thief saw that, and his faith is astounding in this moment, and he, you know, he had all the grounds to hate this thief. He had all the grounds to be selfish, to curse those who killed him, to feel sorry for himself. But instead, he chose to acknowledge his own sin and then to turn to the one dying for it. Choosing humility at the cross means assurance in Christ. Victory through sacrifice. In verse 42 and 43, he says, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, he says. When we come to Christ, there is immediacy of saving. Of being with Jesus in the span of a blink. You know, the thief hadn't lived a good life. He hadn't served for years in the church. He hadn't read the scriptures devotedly, if at all. He hadn't been kind to his fellow man. He was justly charged for his deeds of sinfulness, committing not just robbery, but murder. And yet in that brief moment, he chose to believe. And call out to Christ for forgiveness. And that's exactly what Christ promised him. What a picture this is of being saved by the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of works, lest anyone should boast. This criminal definitely didn't do it by his works. We definitely have not done it by our works.
He saw his own sin and he pursued God's forgiveness and then he was with him. You think about that. The, Bible, the, the, the scriptures don't tell us like when these criminals died on the cross, but you can bet it was fairly soon. And then he was with Christ. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter the unrighteousness. The great promise of Christ's forgiveness isn't based on the past you lived in the world. It's about the present you now live in Christ. Jesus walked the road of truth for his enemies, and it's only because he did that we can experience that promise in him. What a picture of humanity the thieves on the cross are. Some choose to reject him, and others choose to follow him. Despite what little time we may have left, there is still time, which means there is still hope. What side of the cross are you on? You know, whether it's today or another day, someday we will all come face to face with that cross, and we're going to have to decide what it is to us who we believe hung on it, and why he did that. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the foot of the cross is Christ's prayer for forgiveness for us and his promise of paradise to those who trust in Him. Each and every day, we need to live in remembrance of this cross. Choosing humility to the one who went to His death on it, who went humbly and gently and honestly and sacrificially full of forgiveness and truth. Jesus walked the road of forgiveness and truth so that we could walk the road to everything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You. Thank You for who You are. Thank You that You are a forgiving God. Lord, may this, Your Word, not my words, but Your Word, stir in our hearts even now, Lord, and and throughout the day, throughout this weekend. May we do the business with you that we need to do. And may we find freedom and life and that promise in you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen.